Thank you, Vice President. <coughs> Sri Lanka is at a crucial juncture. As the High Commissioner's report makes clear, the current economic crisis is due in part to the long-standing problems. Systematic subversion of key accountability process, the rule of law, and independent human rights institutions as part of the government deliberate attempt to avoid accountability for human rights violations and overall war crime, wartime atrocities created conditions for corruption, abuse of power and prolonged economic mismanagement that are the root of the current crisis. The government violent response to popular protest leaves no room for any optimism about the prospects of meaningful human rights and democratic reforms and accountability under the administration of President Vikramasinghe. Many peaceful protesters, including myself, have been arrested since the new president assumed office. This also includes Vasanta Mudalige, the convener of IUSF, Galveva Siridharmatero, and Hashan Jivant, arrested under PTA, contradicting the de facto moratorium on the use of PTA. We call on government to repeal the PTA. Meanwhile, families of victims of enforced disappearances have faced harassment and and intimidation as they continue their over 2,000 days long demonstration demanding to know the fate of their loved ones. In this context, it is imperative that the Council to enhance scrutiny of the situation and advances the accountability for human rights violation, overall wartime atrocities and economic crimes as well as the Easter attack by strengthening the existing measures and adopting new initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President. Economic crisis on human rights in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka have faced severe shortage of fuel, electricity, food, medicine, and other essentials. Sri Lankan rupee have depreciated against the US dollar, and the inflation has been up 70%. Uh, we demand transparency, accountability on corruption, and economic mismanagement. Uh, impact on economic crisis due to tax cut for super rich, chemical fertilizer ban. Due to this, uh, food production has gone down and the food pr uh, price have gone up. And um, food inflation is 80%. 5.7 million people need humanitarian assistance immediately. 70% of uh, people skip meals and shortage of uh, essential medicine. We request and urge the international community to support Sri Lanka. Um, Easter Sunday attack, which has happened three years ago, we request the government to submit and release the Presidential Council report um, completely to the public and implement all recommendations of the report. And as the government has promised, uh, international investigation to be um, held on this matter and transparency and accountability. Um, militarization, 15% of the government expenditure uh, makes it to military, whereas education and health much less. And uh, there have been peaceful, uh, peaceful protesters who have been suppressed and been arrested. Uh, we condemn this uh, process and we thank the High Commissioner for her commitment and assistance for Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Acting High Commissioner, Excellencies, at the outset I reiterate Sri Lanka's unwavering commitment towards advancing, securing and protecting the human rights of our people and continuing our engagement with the Council in a spirit of cooperation and dialogue. In keeping with our commitment, notwithstanding our categorical rejection of Resolution 46.1, we have submitted Sri Lanka's detailed written response to the High Commissioner's report. Mr. President, we remain cognizant of and acutely sensitive to the events that have taken place in the recent past. The severe economic crisis emanating from factors both internal and external offer many lessons for all. We recall in this context the indivisibility of human rights as enshrined in the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. The government is extremely sensitive to the socio-economic hardship faced by our people and has initiated immediate multi-pronged measures to ensure their well-being through a provision of supplies essential to the life of the community. A staff-level agreement has been reached with the International Monetary Fund and discussions on debt restructuring are in progress. The government is in dialogue with the UN agencies as well as bilateral partners to protect the most vulnerable from the adverse impact of the crisis. The recent changes that have taken place bear testimony to our continued commitment to upholding our long-standing democratic principles and norms. The constitutional right to peacefully assemble, assembly 
an expression guaranteed the democratic space for our people to exercise their right. In, the, in this regard, transgressions of the law resulting in criminal and unlawful activity were addressed in accord with the law and the Constitution. In circumstances where such freedoms were abused by element with vested interests to achieve undemocratic political ends. Mr. President, notwithstanding the severe constraint and challenges, Sri Lanka remains firmly committed to pursuing tangible progress in the protection of human rights and reconciliation through independent domestic institutions. Sri Lanka along with several members of this council have opposed resolution 46-1, fundamentally disagreeing with its legitimacy and objectives. We have consistently highlighted that the contents of the resolution, its operative paragraph 6 in particular, violates the sovereignty of the people of Sri Lanka and the principle of the UN Charter. Once again, we are compelled to categorically reject any follow-up measures to the resolution as well as the related recommendation and conclusion by the High Commissioner. Mr. President, it is observed that the High Commissioner's report makes extensive reference to economic crimes. Apart from the ambiguity of the term, it is a matter of concern that such reference exceeds the mandate of the OHCHR. In this context, we recall the paramount importance of adhering to UNGA Resolution 60-251, 48-141, and the IB package. The proposed 22nd Amendments to the Constitution introduces several salient changes which would strengthen the democratic governance and independent oversight of key institutions and combat corruption, including through the constitutional recognition of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Mr. President, measures aimed at promoting reconciliation and human rights, if they are to be meaningful and sustainable, must be based on cooperation with the country concerned be compatible with the aspiration of its people and being consonant with its basic legal framework. We endeavor to establish a credible truth-seeking mechanism within the framework of the Constitution. The contours of a model that would suit the particular conditions of Sri Lanka are under discussion. The recommendation of the President's Chair Commission of Inquiry have resulted in progressive amendment to the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the release of the detainees. Further recommendations are awaited. As we delivered on the onerous task of review and reform of the PTA this year, to further enhance human rights, we will replace the PTA with a more comprehensive national security legislation in accordance with the international best practices. The recent delisting of groups and individuals will provide further impetus for the constructive dialogue. We will continue to provide the necessary support and resources to strengthen the functioning of independent domestic mechanism, including the Office of the Missing Persons, the Office for Reparation, the Office for National Unity and Reconciliation, and the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. The outreach to the overseas Sri Lankans encompassing all communities will be expanded through the establishment of an office for overseas Sri Lankans. Mr. President, in upholding human rights, we have benefited from the considerable expertise available with other countries as well as the United Nations. We will seek further advice and support on best practices as we proceed and as deemed necessary. Sri Lanka has maintained regular and constructive engagement with the UN treaty bodies, the special procedures and universal periodic review process. We look forward to proactively engage in the upcoming UPR fourth cycle. We have facilitated two visits by the Office of High Commissioner to Sri Lanka this year and provided unimpeded access. Mr. President, it is 13 years since the end of the conflict in Sri Lanka. And since then, a new generation has emerged with their own aspirations. While issues of reconciliation and accountability are being comprehensively addressed through a domestic process, it is time to reflect realistically on the trajectory of this resolution, which has continued on the agenda of the Council for over a decade, and to undertake a realistic assessment on whether it has benefited the people of Sri Lanka. There is a need to acknowledge actual progress on the ground and support Sri Lanka.
The current challenges, though formidable, have provided us with a unique opportunity to work towards institutional changes for the betterment of our people. In a message of unity and reconciliation, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, in his inaugural address to the parliament, said, I quote, if we come together, we'll be able to invigorate the nation, unquote. Mr. President, the people of Sri Lanka remain steadfast and resilient while upholding their democratic values as one of Asia's oldest democracies. We are not hesitant to acknowledge our challenges and forge ahead with renewed vigor. While our immediate concern is economic recovery, advancing human rights of our people is of equal priority. We look to the genuine support and understanding of this council as we proceed on this path. Thank you. Madam Vice President, I represent the transnational government of Tamil Nadu as their human rights minister in this assembly. The transnational government or TGTE is a representative body that represents Nadu Tamils of Sri Lanka in the diaspora. I begin my speech by raising the TGTE's important concerns regarding the UN General Assembly's current approach to Sri Lanka. We believe UN has so far not acted decisively and firmly to make Sri Lanka accountable for the war crimes committed against the Tamil people. Despite the UN Resolution 30-1 and 46-1, Sri Lanka has not paid heed to any of these directions contained in them. The Sri Lankan government has not shown any willingness or desire to implement the directions contained in those resolutions. The Tamils have not only become frustrated and despondent in their endeavors to seek justice for the mass killings and enforced disappearances of their loved ones, but also about the current ongoing human rights abuses against their community. The Sri Lankan government is continuing to grab the Tamil lands illegally and settle them with the Sinhalese. And this was the last speaker we could accommodate for this dialogue. And I now give the floor to the Acting High Commissioner for her concluding remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the many thoughtful interventions and particularly for the expressions of solidarity and support to Sri Lanka. Let me reiterate at the outset the continued commitment of the office to an open, frank and constructive dialogue with the government. National ownership is, as the Philippines mentioned, essential for sustainability. And this has been, indeed, a hallmark of our extensive cooperation for many years. I am pleased that the new context provides new openings for engagement in this regard. Um, let me turn now to the questions. Um, Ireland gave an important focus to the increased risks faced by women in the face of these successive crises. I wish to say, like other countries, the restrictions imposed by the pandemic and now the impact of the economic crisis are believed to have exacerbated uh, the problems of violence against women in particular. Women have been particularly vulnerable uh, to the impact of crises on livelihoods and in the maternal health sector. In the North and East, many victims today are women-headed households, uh, vulnerable to harassment by security forces and others, and this requires a gender-sensitive approach. Um, Canada asked about further opportunities to advancing accountability in the Netherlands regarding obstacles to the transitional justice process. We have encouraged the development of a comprehensive national um, transitional justice roadmap with clear benchmarks and linkages between various mechanisms. This needs to go beyond the existing uh, Office of Missing Persons and the Office for Reparations to include further elements of truth-seeking and criminal accountability, um, including security sector and institutional reform. And I welcome uh, the offer of Nepal and others to share experience in this regard. We note the government's intention to now develop a truth-seeking mechanism. This would be an important contribution if it is in line with international standards, but it must be accompanied by um, criminal and other accountability measures. Any truth commission must be independent of state institutions or external parties. It requires a clear and powerful mandate including powers to require the cooperation of public authorities and access to official documents. Of course, significant financial resources um, as well. 
um, and independent commissioners of high integrity that can be representative of all parts of Sri Lankan society, including victims. Uh, one of the reasons that existing mechanisms have struggled is that they have failed to win the confidence of victims and their families. Too many past commissions and initiatives have not produced credible results. Even the Office of Missing Persons, which we have supported, uh, is really oriented, and there was a comment to this regard, towards closing files rather than establishing the fate of missing loved ones. Uh, it's essential that victims are fully on board with the design as well as the implementation of these processes. Uh, meanwhile, we have outlined several opportunities for states to act on accountability individually and collectively. Uh, including using all forms of uh, potential forms of jurisdiction. Um, states can also support initiatives to further strengthen and empower victims and civil society, as we said. Switzerland and the United States asked how the international community can support Sri Lanka. Uh, in the issue of inclusive national dialogues and the political reform process. Uh, much work was already done during the 2016 national consultation process, which engaged Sri Lankans from all communities and stakeholders, um, victims, but also religious leaders, civil society organizations, and the military. There are many formats through which this dialogue can be taken forward. What is important is that it is inclusive and that it brings together all communities, including minorities from all parts of the country, including that it takes place in an environment where freedom of expression and peaceful assembly are fully respected. Young people who have inspired us all in the recent crisis, as in many parts of the world, and Sri Lankan women should be given a central voice and role. Um, Sri Lanka and other delegations raised the question of economic crimes. The Human Rights Council, in its thematic resolutions, has focused on the linkages between corruption and human rights, and the human rights treaty bodies have also paid increasing attention to these issues. The Sri Lanka situation is an important illustration of how human rights and corruption concerns intersect. While traditionally we have focused on accountability for human rights violations, the broad demands uh, from Sri Lankans today is for accountability for corruption, the abuse of power, and economic crimes that have impacted human rights. And we therefore welcome the commitments made by the government to tackle corruption. And going forward, um, it is going to be very important to monitor how these two tracks for accountability are advanced and can mutually reinforce each other. Um, Madam Vice President, Sri Lanka is once again, as many delegations pointed out, uh, at a critical juncture. The government and the people are dealing with the magnitude of an economic crisis as well as its political fallout, in addition to a long legacy of conflict. Sustainable recovery, development and peace can only be achieved if there is an end to impunity and the deep institutional reforms that can prevent the recurrence of violations from the past. Advancing the devolution of political authority is also integral to reconciliation, as noted by India, and also in past Council resolutions. We therefore encourage the international community to support Sri Lanka in its recovery, but also in addressing the underlying causes of the crisis, including the entrenched impunity that has undermined the rule of law. Finally, let me also say the Human Rights Council has played an important role in accompanying Sri Lanka over many years. And for all the challenges, the Sri Lankan governments successively have remained engaged with the office and the mechanisms. We very much believe this council should remain closely engaged and continue to monitor developments in support of accountability efforts. These very much respond to the unprecedented call from Sri Lanka's own people, particularly, as I said, young people, for justice, reconciliation, and human rights. Thank you very much. Madam Vice President, Vietnam acknowledges Sri Lanka's strong commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights in line with the country's constitution and international obligations, as well as its engagement with the Human Rights Council and the OHCHR in a spirit of cooperation and constructive dialogue. We welcome the progress made by Sri Lanka on the implementation of voluntary commitment since the 46th session of the Human Rights Council, despite severe challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic difficulties. 
We also commend Sri Lanka's efforts in strengthening national unity and reconciliation through various coordinated measures, including legislative reform, land release, and various forms of reparation for victims of past conflicts. Sri Lanka has also made encouraging headway on the implementation of the SDGs. We hope that the cultural and international partners will continue enhancing constructive dialogue, technical cooperation, and capacity building in Sri Lanka for strong recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, social economic development, and realization of SDG in the country, thus better enabling the enjoyment of human rights by the people of Sri Lanka. I thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Ambassador. You're watching the Live Traveler Channel.